Well, good morning, everybody. Here's the plan for my forecast video here on Friday. We're going to talk about how we have four systems that are expected to come through the Pacific Northwest. We're going to talk about how the last couple of them might make it all the way to the upper Midwest, really increasing precipitation chances. We need to discuss where the remnants of Francine are going to go, which it looks more and more likely that the heaviest rains are going to be coming into Alabama. I know we had some concern yesterday about uh, the European model's biggest uh, rain bands coming into parts of, of Georgia, but it seems as though we've seen a little bit better, or a little bit more information, and now we're seeing those heavier rains coming into um, you know into Alabama. We're also going to be watching next week for the development of a tropical like low that's off the uh, southeast coast, and where its rain is going to be coming through. And then we're going to be discussing, I think, some of the bigger picture things going on with this temperature pattern really favoring a large ridge that's going to be anchored over like the Hudson Bay area for a while and what that heat might do to a lot of the eastern half of the country for this late in the season. And we're going to get into more on La Nina and take a look again at those seasonal forecasts. And we'll finish it up with South America. So if we just take a look here at yesterday's satellite data, just as the sun was setting again, broad cloud shield uh, around um, what's left of Francina. Excuse me, Francine. I have a very close friend named Francina. Uh, we were we worked together at the University of Illinois, so I apologize if I've accidentally said that multiple times um, in these last few couple of, of videos. Um, Francine here spinning its way uh, toward the Mid-South, and it's kind of going to stall. I mean, we're just going to run out of any reason for this to continue to really push hard to the north. So we'll get a look at that northward extent on the precipitation in just a few moments. But the deep low that moved into the um, kind of the northwest here, getting into Montana, did produce some pretty nasty storms yesterday. And uh, also on the backside, we've seen snow at really high elevation right in through here. But I was looking here more, um, just I always get fascinated by looking at the wildfire smoke, like this very narrow ribbon of smoke here. And some of the fires that were um, kind of blew up yesterday on the strong winds, you know, we had those red flag warnings out for a broad section of the uh, plains on the 40 plus mile an hour winds that were expected there. And if we just have a look here, you can see in, in this part of South Dakota, uh, just some of the, there it is, some of that wildfire smoke coming from a fire right about here. And um, now that is not to, you know, undermine some of the huge fires or not to, I don't mean undermine, but not pay attention to some of the huge fires that continue to burn around Los Angeles, as you can see here on the satellite data. But I wanted you to see the effect of those strong winds uh, in the plains. Well, if we look at Francine, uh, the circulation is moving its way toward, um, you know, this part of Missouri. But it didn't make a whole lot of northward progress after you got through about uh, midnight last night and, and going forward. It's just kind of been spinning here with some of the rain bands on the outer side of this getting down into southern Illinois, southern Indiana, Kentucky. And it's, I guess, positioned best to make a turn back in this direction. We're going to look at that in just a few moments. But I wanted to give some idea on how much moisture we've got out of these first two systems we're watching, knowing there are still three more coming into the northwest and we have the low that's going to be developing off the Carolina coast. So nationally, looking at some of these precipitation totals, you just kind of have an idea of what the last 72 hours have looked like. I want to focus in on a couple of areas, though. Let's go to the southeast first, lower Mississippi River Valley. You know, we were calling for that widespread one to five inches, and I think that was pretty good forecast overall for this area. Certainly the western side of this was the hardest part to forecast, but parts of Mississippi getting into, you know, western Tennessee, this part of Arkansas did pick up several inches of rain. Now down here, uh, closer to New Orleans, we had places that picked up over a foot of rainfall out of this setup. And uh, we're going to be looking for much more rain to come through this part of Alabama into Georgia very soon. But that's what I have as of 7 a.m. Eastern time uh, this morning. Just to keep an eye on those power outages, uh, Texas right now has about almost 13,000 without power. I'm curious where those are, by the way. Uh, most of them here, looks like some of these numbers have come down a bit this morning. Maybe they're now down to 5,000. Let's get an update on this map. Yeah, now we're down below 5,000, sorry. <clears throat> but in uh, Louisiana, we still have uh, about 125,000 without power. And I'm sure the crews are working hard to get that restored. The other side of this takes us up to uh, the northwest, getting into the southern Canadian prairie, where you can see some very large precipitation totals. And as we just have a look at this, remember some of these storms that were streaking through here and into the Dakotas were hailers. So we did get some large hail out of some of these as well. But again, we still have three more storm systems that are going to be following the trajectory as we go forward uh, in this forecast. Now, on the soil moisture side, we're going to get a better look at this next week. But this is the current 40 centimeter. I did show you 100 centimeter earlier this week. I'm going to just take it down to 16 inches now. This is 
how things look back on September the 8th, okay? And this is what they look like now. So if you've not been in the Northwest or around Francine, uh, the soil moisture problems have gotten worse and worse. It's been very dry. And if you just look at the last two weeks in terms of a percent of normal precipitation, now this was through yesterday morning. So we'll get a new update of this uh, for today's, uh, yesterday's data and today's, and once we get into uh, Saturday. But we have large areas in the, in the plains uh, here from Oklahoma through Kansas, Missouri, Illinois, Eastern Corn Belt, you know, um, up into Michigan that <clears throat> honestly haven't measured much at all. While this is still capturing the very heavy rains we had about 12 days ago here in Central Texas, and we've also now seen the combination of the rain ahead of Francine and then Francine's rainfall down here in the lower uh, Mississippi River Valley. But uh, take note of the dryness that's been up the East Coast as well, especially in the Northeast. And uh, it'll be very important to see where this potential tropical system is here. It'll be kind of a, I don't know, it looks more of a hybrid to me. It's got some colder upper level heights in it. Regardless, we're going to have to just see where this goes to dump some moisture into this area as well. In the Northwest, this is just an area that I expect to see continue to change, getting more and more on the blue side of the color spectrum given this pattern we're going through. But you know, we have been watching the Mississippi very carefully. And just want to show you that this morning, the Mississippi made a turn up about a foot. Uh, but it didn't, we weren't expecting major recovery here because of the headwaters still having such little soil moisture in them. So if we just take a look, maybe let's go to the last 30 days. You know, we can just see this drop, this almost continuous drop. And right there has been the influence of, <clears throat> excuse me, Francine's moisture so far uh, through this setup. Okay. Um, after this, we don't have a lot to be talking about in the tropics. It was likely that uh, seven will be named later today, but I'm going to be keeping a much closer eye on what's happening off of the Carolina coast and where Francine goes after this. So there's no, um, I think, major tropical systems forming in the Atlantic. We'll just need to keep a close eye on that going forward. But let's kind of get in here and have a quick look at the next seven days focusing on the south and southeast. So the newest WPC forecast all right, takes the heaviest rains from Francine and turns them right in through here. So this is going to be quite wet, leaving uh, parts of Tennessee into Alabama and Georgia. Still the possibility of a pretty widespread three to five inches of rain. And then like we said, next Monday, Tuesday, we'll keep an eye on low pressure development just off the coast and how that could spread rain into the Carolinas and Virginia. So I just wanted you to see that quick hit here on the forecast uh, for the southeast given these two tropical systems we're keeping an eye on all right bigger picture things though i made this case for us this week that um, so much of the pattern in the northern hemisphere is being dominated by this so the map's a little tricky to look at because it's focused on the atlantic and along the prime meridians where the center of this map is but here are the lows in the north pacific that get into the bering sea so come back over on this side of the map and there's the ridging that's to the south of it. It's here and here. Now, because of that, we're seeing these lows roll over the top of this ridge, come into the west, and then have to get out by leaving over the top of this ridge. That's over the kind of the eastern side of Canada. And we're getting a reflection of that here across northern Europe into northern Russia as well. Okay, So this, this pattern also tends to leave lower pressure over the southeast. And my point is to say that th this is the forecast for the next 15 days. And when you would just average the entire height pattern together, and that's looking very, very similar to this. Now, I realize that the center of this map is at 180 degrees. And so I apologize that the, the, the map issues here. But do you see what I just described still showing up? And I'm going to ask a question later in this video as to how long I think something like this is going to be the case. Like how long are we going to see... A pattern like this because we certainly know that while we projected this dryer in through here we do have one of these lows that's going to get all the way through and that'll be midweek next week and that's going to hit parts of the midwest upper midwest with some really heavy precipitation if it verifies the way we're currently seeing the forecast play out so there's still a lot about this pattern that screams wpo is the most dominant factor in the near term so we look today at the winds, and this is what we're seeing. So here's the first of four lows. There it is spinning up here. Strong flow in this direction, but what's left of Francine isn't necessarily getting pulled into this. And what you're going to watch here as we go forward is that Francine, let's just take this up to the mid-levels of the atmosphere, doesn't have a lot of incentive to, to go anywhere. There's this blocking high to the north of it. There's better flow to the south of it. And so Francine's going to sit here and spin and then slowly migrate 
down toward the south and east. But as we look at this overall pattern, the, the source region of the next three systems at least is coming right out of here and just diving, following this pattern into the northwest. So let's see how that's going to play out because there's certainly not a whole lot to talk about in the tropics to kind of push this around in any sort of way. I will mention what's going on down here with Eilina in just a few moments, but I want you to see this forecast playing out kind of day by day here. So we're going to go to the upper level height pattern and just kind of get a good look at this. So throughout the day today into Saturday. So do you see how that trough just boom went right up here into this part of the Canadian prairie, leaving what's left of Francine to kind of just meander. It's got no incentive to move because of the larger ridge to the north of it. That's, that's the main idea. That, that is a bigger part of the steering current of this system. So in other words, there's no big ridge to the east or to the west to kind of push it around and the troughs too far away. So what we're going to watch is going through Saturday into Sunday. The next deep low gets here by Monday morning. As it starts to work its way through, take a look at the drop in heights that's occurring here. That would be the system next Monday, Tuesday, and early Wednesday that forms just off the coast. You're going, wait a minute, I don't see it. Well, remember, tropical in nature, those types of systems don't have really cold cores. There's just a little one right here, which is why I call this a bit of a hybrid system. But by next Wednesday, we kind of have that setup we often talk about in winter. So there's a trough on the backside helping to fling, fling excuse me, the lead trough out ahead of it. See that? So as we play out here Wednesday, Thursday, that one goes right into the Canadian Prairie. The next one behind it dips down into California, and it comes out right there. And that's the one I'm interested in. Now, I'm interested in all of them, but the timing next Friday of this low on the backside kicking the lead wave out here is what's going to be critical to determining how much of this moisture gets into the Midwest late next week. And then we see a system following it. And then we get into a bit of a reset. Notice the lower heights showing up again here. The deep troughs coming back into the you know, Gulf of Alaska. And what preceded the current setup? A big warm-up in the United States. A big one. So I, I think that through much of September, we see this pattern in some form of a repeat. It will have nuances to it, of course. So it won't look exactly the same. And certainly I don't see another tropical system in the near term. So Fran, uh, something like Francine is out. But... This whole setup coming out of Alaska into the Gulf of Alaska, dropping troughs in here, we may go through a, another round of that to finish out this month. So tuck that away in the back of your head because I'm going to reference it one more time at the end of this video. From here, this morning's all hazards weather map, we have the flood watches extending from Tennessee down into parts of Alabama, Georgia, clipping a little bit of, of uh, Mississippi. Quite hot in southern um, Florida, flood watches here around the Jacksonville area, but then much colder to the north and west. We got a freeze warning out for this part of Oregon and still winter weather advisories here. And these are all air quality issues for the uh, wildfires that continue in those areas. Let's watch one of our high res models picking this up early this morning, playing through the middle of the day today into this evening. We watch a front go over the Red River of the north. We see what's left of Francine kind of disorganized here in terms of precipitation, but still spinning. There it is. That's that kind of heavy rain quarter we're expecting to develop. This is through Saturday morning, getting into Saturday afternoon and evening, and playing this out here until we get to Sunday midday. So you can kind of see how what's left of Francine's getting tucked into a corridor here of potentially very heavy rainfall through that area. Now you saw for a moment there, there's a circulation coming into the Baja. See it right down here? And that circulation is a part of another tropical system named Eilina. And the current forecast track of Eilina is to quickly dissipate and become a tropical depression. But there are some forecasts taking what's left of the moisture of Eilina and trying to bring it into Arizona. So we just need to keep an eye on this. I was watching it yesterday and decided not to comment on it in yesterday's video, but maybe it's a bit more worthy of that now. But the other piece, okay, so we've, we're going to look closely at this in a few moments, but the other big things to think about here is look at the moisture coming in through this area and then watch that wave get kicked out late next week to really increase the chances of rainfall here in this part of the upper Midwest and Northern Plains. That's the newest WPC forecast for the next seven days. Here is the national blend of models, very similar. And we've got a really wet corridor uh, in this area. This is now, uh, next let's go look at the artificial intelligence. And let's look at the high res, the European high res model. 
And uh, it's still quite aggressive on those rainfall totals coming into Georgia, but they're no longer like right over Atlanta like they were the other day. They're a bit more on that corridor we've identified right through here. And this is the latest from the GFS. So I did get some comments from you about the size of the numbers. You seem to like the GFS map the best. So I will be making those adjustments over the next couple of weeks when I have some time to get into the coding again to do this. Uh, but that is your seven day GFS total precip outlook. From here, let's go have a look at the European model solution. I am working on combining the European and GFS again for us, but let's just play this through what we've already seen. That's through the high res uh, NAM version, which lines up really well with the high res European. And let's play this out into, you know, early next week, Monday and Tuesday. Now at that point, we're watching something develop here in our next deep low moving into Idaho and Montana. So what do we see? This is by next Wednesday, Thursday. There's one low, the other one moving its way toward this part of Manitoba, dragging a front by next Friday right over the upper Midwest. So you can see that moisture right there. And it's followed, remember, by that second wave. And now the European operational run took it much farther to the south than the artificial intelligence. But it is important to note that there might be enough cold air in this to produce some snow in the Rockies right here. So I wouldn't give this particular run of the European model too much weight overall. I think we're going to have to stick with the blend of models like we just saw a few moments ago. Um, windy, though, I, I do think we're going to have some strong winds getting into the Great Basin, still coming out of parts of Montana, Wyoming, and into the plains with this. But the models did back off on the risk of the really strong winds with the tropical low that could be developing off the Carolina coast. We now no longer see the onshore winds of 50 miles an hour like we had seen in earlier forecasts. From here, let's go to some probability maps and let's look at the, who's going to be on the drier side of this. So you notice we haven't talked much about Texas in the south. We've not talked a lot about any of these systems making their way into and breaking down the huge ridge which is here. So to the south of that, from the eastern Great Lakes and eastern Corn Belt all the way into the northeast, very low probabilities of having uh, rainfall greater than a tenth of an inch. And while we do see one of our troughs getting down here into California, the total rainfall expected out of that's low, and the rain shadow effect, given that a lot of this flows out of the west, is still quite um, you know obvious here for the Columbia Basin. On the wetter side of this, yeah, we got a new run in here. Let's flip that back. On the wetter side of it, this is the probability over the next 10 days of an inch. Very narrow corridor seen through here and there, but take a look at the increase we've now seen in the upper Midwest and Northern Plains, given that system next week we have to have a conversation about. And this is the probability of two inches. And as we look at the real flood threat here, this is the best chance of getting four. So we have what's left of Francine, and then we have the tropical development off the coast. I do wanna point out that the CPC continues to highlight this region for the 20th and 21st for the a slight risk of heavy precipitation and also of course over here given the the low that's forming so we'll need to be watching those very very carefully uh, next week all right looking purely at week two we still have pretty consistent model behavior overall um, and if we just kind of um, I, I think i think all four maps are pretty similar so let's just focus in on the european ensemble it's now picking up on that third and fourth system coming through the Midwest, stretching its rainfall, maybe down to the Texas Panhandle. We have the tropical system here, but if you're in between, you know this whole region is showing up drier, all influenced by the broader ridge that's living in this area. So I like those week two forecasts all kind of lining up with something similar overall. From there, let's talk about the cold side of this being in the Western United States, the heat being in the East. This is where we do have the risk of the patchy frost at lower elevation, but all the rest of this is at relatively high elevation. If we take a look at the high temperatures forecast, all cloud cover dominated here and here, but the deeper trough in the Northwest is what's keeping it cool there. That's Saturday's highs, getting into Sunday and Monday, much cooler air dipping in with that other trough that gets all the way into California here, with high temperatures trying to get out of the 70s in the Central Valley. This is now looking at Tuesday and Wednesday. Whoops, went too fast. There's Wednesday and Thursday. And if we look beyond that, we can just kind of look at our panels. I, I like this view. I hope it's not too small on your screen, but I can just quickly see if there's agreement between the models. The two big ones I like to use for the 
five-day chunks are the ECMWF Ensemble and the GFS Ensemble. I do note that the GFS Ensemble has a bit more of a washed out look once we get out there day 10 through 15. And it might be signaling you know, this reset in the pattern as we work our way toward the end of the month of September. And I wanna to talk to you about what I think might happen at the end of September. But it is important to note that the cold air that's coming in around the 19th and 20th, so remember, this is when the big low is ejecting here, having us uh, the risk of the heavier rains, much colder air behind this, so they've put out a risk of hazardous temperatures uh, you know, in parts of the Great Basin. All right, where do we finish with this video? Okay, let's look now at the WPO. You notice that I said something seems to be changing at the end of the month. And what it is, is it's the likelihood that this WPO signal runs out of its very positive values around, if you can see it squint your eyes down here, around the very beginning of uh, October. Now, it's not as though the WPO is forecast to just plummet and completely change phase, but it's no longer expected to be so positive. And so what we're going to be thinking about is what other things could be changing at that time period. And this will be the other piece of the flow I'll be watching. The MJO right now is in phase five, and it's going to stay there for a bit longer. If it does end up, you know, kind of jumping out here and coming around and making its way over through phase seven and eight, that could be important because phase eight, when we have a uh, La Nina building, actually reinforces these western U.S., western Canada troughs in a big ridge here. You're going, what? okay, what, that's the pattern we're in right now, almost. It looks something similar to this. But I'm, I'm curious as to how long that's going to last and if October is going to give us a little bit of a different flavor. If the MJO goes to phase eight and the WPO doesn't just completely fade to nothing, then the beginning of October is going to be very much like the pattern we're in right now. But if these two things don't work together, then I think we could have a different look for the beginning of October. All right. And the other piece to this is what's going on with La Nina. We've seen the Southern Oscillation Index stay well above seven. It's still here, indicating the trade winds are still you know, moving quickly across the equator. I can show you that. This is that, that trade wind push we've seen and notice that over much of the next seven, eight, nine, 10 days, we still have strong easterly winds in this area. And there's gonna be a push again over here. And that's what the trade winds are gonna do. They're gonna have these kind of ebbs and flows as this La Nina continues to develop. But if you look, if La Nina takes over in October. But the only difference I would have to tell you is that while it's very common to have troughs of low pressure here, which is also common with the WPO signal, which is also common with MGO phase eight, we make it more ridging, meaning that we would be sending more of these systems into Western Canada and maybe the Northwest rather than deep into the United States. That, that could be the difference if La Nina tends to dominate. And I think that because both the La Nina signal and the WPO signal are so strong right now that the new European model forecast is, is kind of giving us that. Do you notice for October, where's the wettest corridor? It's here. So coming underneath this low, the strongest flow is making the turn into British Columbia. And we see some of the wetness a little bit in the Northwest, but pretty large dry signal here. And now we're starting to see it back farther to the West as well. That, that, this map right here screams to me La Nina building, MJO trying to get to phase eight, and uh, the WPO signal still quite strong. And I'll just say it again because I have to say it in every video. This we don't know about. I mean, we could have another tropical system very easily forming in the Gulf of Mexico and coming right into this area, making this forecast, you know, null and void, just not even working. But if we end up getting troughs here, you will have ridging here. And that is why. We see the temperature forecasts, you know, looking like this. So is that echoed anywhere else? Yeah, I mean, the W, excuse me, the CFSV2, the Climate Forecasting System Model version 2, also has a lot of central North America warmth going to the end of September and the beginning of October. And I was just in Minnesota yesterday talking with some folks, and we need more heat on the crop there. It's got, it needs more time before we get into this risk of frost. So let's, um, you know, we need to see this pattern play out for some people across the United States. From there, let's get back into discussion about La Nina because yesterday, the Climate Prediction Center released their newest La Nina forecast, which is back up to where it was in the previous month. 
suggesting this reaches a peak probably in December, which would be climatologically consistent, and they've now taken it back up to 83%. So last month it was down to 75, it's back up to 83. Remember that this is a probability map. It is not a strength map. What I'm most concerned about is the strength. And I also wanna know, does it really fade by next spring? And we get back in so neutral conditions. That will be critical for any sort of a long-term precipitation forecast for the United States. But as it stands, you know, what's, you know what this looks like. And so I'm just going to show it to you again, every model we've had so far, which we should be getting new updates from the Climate Prediction Center very soon to add to this, <clears throat> excuse me, but every forecast I've seen for fall and winter has looked some, some version of this, which is drier across the south, wetter north initially, then very much drier along the Gulf Coast with a very you know, highly variable, but North Pacific jet that dives in here and exits there. You've seen me draw that a dozen times. That's every model. They all look something like this. So I want to finish with some other places around the world. I'm going to give you the October, November, December outlook globally. Uh, so we can kind of look at a few other places. Notice how wet Australia is expected to be in this compared to average. But I'm curious about why the NMME looks like it does in South America for October, November, December, looking at this drier signal pretty far to the north. Okay, there's just pop probability being drier. And then this, I was not expecting the NMME to do that for December, January, February, given that all of the other subseasonal and seasonal models are wet in this corridor. So that, that's a very important key difference. The NMME for the heart of their growing season in, in Brazil it's got a little bit of a drier outlook. So, you know, what do we do? I don't know. We have to just watch this carefully and see if we can <clears throat> make some sense of it because we certainly know it's been dry as of late. Just take a look at the last week of wildfire smoke. That's September 7th. There's the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and here's yesterday. We have a front advancing. We're going to get some rain out of this. In fact, over the next 10 days, very wet coming out of Paraguay into Paraná, Santa Catarina, and Rio Grande do Sul. Some places here easily picking up four inches of rain. I think that's possible out of this, which means that's way too much. That's major flooding. They had major flooding episodes there earlier this year as well. So this is a problem in Southern Brazil. But every time I look, you've now watched me do this for two straight weeks. October, when Brazil plants 80% of its soybeans, we still see in the European model a signal for wetter conditions here. And the consistency in the model is what I want us to be paying attention to. So we have to be watching out for this as we go forward because this would mean a pretty, you know, good start to their growing season given that we're expecting wet the normal conditions. So I'm going to stop there. We'll keep watching these features and work on the long-range forecast over the weekend, and we'll pick this up again on Monday. Have a good one. Thanks.